you're ready for this. Gonna be fun. You will not stand in my way. Frostborn hunger displeases me. I do not fear you, mortal. Your soul shall be mine. Don't make me laugh. Who needs a boot? Oh, I do. Fill a shredding, baby. Let the battle begin. <laughs> So hello and welcome to the 77th episode of the Nexus Trolls, a podcast all about Heroes of the Storm, part of the Trolls.gg Entertainment Network. I'm your host, Daz, and I'm joined today, as always, by Mystic. Mystic, how have your past couple weeks been? Because we missed last week. Oh yeah, the last week where uh, we didn't have we have a show, but there was a lot of stuff going on in the Nexus. Well, it kind of worked out because not a ton happened last week, so we can still play catch up and not be too far behind, I feel. <laughs> uh, we've had Deckard released since our last show, which seems like ages ago now. Uh, but like I said, we did miss our last show. And I think this is the first show we've had to cancel since Christmas. I think we canceled one after Christmas like a couple of years ago. So it's kind of strange taking two weeks off. Did you did you book a trip to like Hawaii or something? Or what did you do with your free time last Thursday? Uh, unfortunately not. I spent it doing, you know, catch up on homework instead. So, uh, that, that was, uh, fruitful. <laughs> gives you a little bit more time to cram, eh? I'm glad I'm not in yeah. school anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, sorry listeners that we did have that extra week off. It was just an unfortunate family issue that I had to deal with, which, uh, was kind of last minute. So we didn't have a chance to set up a contingency plan, which we have done in the past. Uh, Liquid's not with us this week. He had a family issue come up, so he is going to be joining us next week, though, uh, along with Goon Hots is going to be coming on next week as well to uh, join us in a four-man show uh, rolling in next week. But this week, we're going to be talking a lot about Deckard, uh, some more strategy and depth stuff, because we really haven't divin too deep. Divin? Dovin? Divin? We haven't dived too deep into him. Uh, so we're going to be doing that today, talking about our builds and what we think about the old man. And then there's a few other topics we're going to talk about as well, just, you know, the top tanks, healers, and melee assassins in the meta. Uh, but before we get into the show, what we always do is thank our patrons over at patreon.com slash trollsgg. If you're looking for a way to support the show, you can head over there and you can do so. Every little bit helps. The show's always going to be free. But if you're looking for a way to support us, that's the best place to do it. And our troll of the week this week, Soken. Soken uh, is one of the casters of the Bush League, the beer league that we've been putting together, and we've talked about you know briefly on the past several episodes. Uh, he's been casting a bunch of the games with Goon, and he actually did last week's games uh, too. And he's a really great caster. Check him out: twitch.tv slash Soken Gaming S O K E N Gaming. If you want to catch any of the stuff that he does, or you can catch him on Monday nights on Bush League uh, every third week. All right, well, with that, let's just roll right into the news. Someday, this will make a great story. So Bush League is still going on. We're in week six coming up next Monday. And our our team, and I say our, meaning myself and Liquid, we are zero and five. Uh, <laughs> yes, we uh, had a level 20. We were on Tomb of the Spider Queen last week. It was level 20. I think we had like a one or two level lead at least. Uh, we wiped, we hit, killed one or two of their characters. We went boss, and we were a couple of gems shy of a turn. So we got the boss, and we ended up throwing it after the boss was capped because we ended up losing a couple guys. They cleared the boss, no problem. There wasn't even a keep that the bot, boss had to go through. Put a little bit of damage on the core, but not enough to finish it. They ended up getting the next turn, snowballing the win. Felt bad. They had Cho'Gall, too. It feels even worse when you lose to a Cho'Gall comp, but, you know, well on Tower Baron, or sorry, not Tower Baron, Tower Baron's team, uh, which is, please don't ban Diablo. Good job on beating us again, but if you're looking, if you want to see us hopefully get our first win, we're going to be playing Zex's team, FTBRG, next Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's going to be cast by Nexus Commentaries. You can check that out at twitch.tv slash Nexus Commentaries. More information about it you can always go to bush league one word dot trolls dot gg we just updated our website too so there's a lot of cool stuff there including leaderboards etc and you'll notice that me and liquid are nowhere near the top of any of those leaderboards <laughs> probably because of our 0 and 5 record uh also nice little treat too for those of you that watch bush league next week afterwards we're going to be doing a nexus feud episode which we haven't done 
I think since November ish. Uh, it's a family feud style game show that I I've been hosting. Last time was Gankbush Squad versus the Trolls family, uh, and Gankbush won. So they're carrying on to this round or this episode, and they're gonna be playing Nexus commentaries. So we're gonna be doing it after Bush League at 10:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over at twitch.tv slash trollsgg, and we need some people to participate in their survey. So check out the show notes. Uh, I'll drop the link in chat there too. Uh, we are looking for people to fill out that survey to be take part in it. Um, so other than that, we also have some HGC news. Unfortunately, Liquid's not here <laughs> to, to kind of go into these in detail, but he was on yesterday with Slug Hunter and McIntyre, uh, as well as I believe Goon and Bags were both on as well. So they had a pretty stacked show. They went over everything HGC. So if you want to hear more about uh, the Crucible, the playoffs, uh, as well as Heroes of the Dorm, check that out. Troll and HGC, the podcast there. But for those of you interested in catching HGC Crucible, it's this weekend. LFM, our boy Hero Physio, we're rooting for you, is taking on XD. And No Tomorrow is playing King's Gambit, trying to defend their spot in the HGC. And in EU, Leftovers is playing Granite Gaming, and Diamond Skin is playing one of the best names so far, Worst Positioning. So always fun to see the Crucible, see how teams fare when their life is on the line. Heroes the Dorm is going to be May 12th, the Heroic Four, Buffalo versus CPP, and Laval versus Kentucky. You're going to be watching. What do you have you been watching any Heroes of the Dorm or or HCC recently, Mystic? Uh, here and there, like some Korea, some Heroes of the Dorm when it you know comes up and. Just... Do you, Do you have a favorite in uh, Heroes of the Dorm that you're rooting for of these four? Uh, Buffalo actually, because uh, I put them to win. The thing. Oh. So they're, they're, did you you filled out a bracket? Are they? Uh... I, I did fill out a bracket. It, it didn't like turn out that well, but <laughs> uh, you know, like. Well, it's tough to predict these things. Is I mean, uh, was Buffalo a favorite? I don't even know. Like, was this a dark horse that you picked to win, or were they expected to do well? Uh, it was kind of. I was just looking at the teams. I was like, oh, this team looks really good, and uh, yeah, I picked them to win the whole thing. Well, congrats, so. Miss. That's, I mean, they haven't well, won the whole thing we yet. Don't know I guess they're gonna win yet. So, but they've gotten to the heroic four. It's better than my yeah, my. At uh, least they got to the heroic four. That's better than my horrible, horrible picks. I, I've I've lost them all a long time ago. Uh, but uh, on to lighter news. Con before the storm Kickstarter. That's the event. That's the day before BlizzCon. That has a bunch of like art galleries, like meetups, a bunch of podcasting panels and stuff they do uh, with World of Podcasts. That they've got their Kickstarter goal funded, so it will be happening this year. Uh, they got done pretty quickly, but they're still looking for for a little bit more money to meet some stretch goals to expand the event. So if you're interested in that, head over to conbeforestorm.com. It's not conbeforethestorm.com. Just conbeforestorm.com. And that's taking place November 1st. Uh, so along with BlizzCon, talking about Con Before the Storm, BlizzCon tickets are actually going on sale soon. Uh, and this is the kind of thing you don't want to snooze for. Because on May, 11, May 9th and May 12th at 7 p.m. Pacific on May 9th and 10 a.m. Pacific on May 12th, they're going to be going on sale you gotta get them fast too. Just the we got the link in the show notes. You can also just Google BlizzCon 2018. You'll be able to find everything there. But make sure you've got the page ready to go and just click on that button as soon as you you find it, see it appear to start the whole process. Because if you can't get it within the first couple of minutes, it's likely you're probably gonna miss the boat. You just gotta be a little bit on the ball with these things. Um, I'm personally gonna be there trying to get as many ticks as possible. Hopefully, we'll be able to get them first round here, Mystic. Because uh, I think last time we didn't get enough the first round because we, 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 were, we were noobs trying to go to BlizzCon here. But we ended up getting some in round two so we could get the whole Trolls team to go. You looking forward to BlizzCon this year? Oh, I think your mic might be muted, bud. I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to see if I can't find uh, you know some time that I can get down there. Oh, we'll get you down there for sure. We can't, it wouldn't be uh, the Nexus Trolls without having you and Liquid there for sure too, but I'm looking forward to that. And if anyone, and if anyone of the listeners are, are coming out too, definitely tweet us, let us know, because we'd love to meet up with you and, and hang out. Spend one of the best times to do that. It's actually come before storm, the storm the day before. 
few other things have happened, as we mentioned. Deckard's in the Nexus. I feel like that's old news now because it was a couple weeks ago, but uh, I guess maybe a little bit more recent news. One of his game-breaking bugs has been fixed. His level four talent reju- rejuvenation potions that restored mana would also restore things like tracer ammo and like give his energy to Zarya. Any of those like non mana bars that you have, it would restore stuff there, but they've fixed that. So you can't take advantage of that anymore. Um, so that's been fixed. And also one thing too, that not a lot of people have been talking about, but I'm really happy is that the C button is back. And if you never press the C button again, that brought up the info panel. So now you can press that to see your info panel. I'm not sure if it does the whole thing like it used to, but at least brings up yours. So if you're dead, you can look at your your stats. You don't have to worry about like clicking on your alt clicking on yourself or your portrait or whatever. Uh, we also had uh, the Dark Nexus has come to the Nexus. Uh, Gul'dan Nalarak skins, Dark Nexus Hound Mount, and then Dark Nexus Manta Mount. I love that Alarak skin. You got it too, being a StarCraft fan, eh, Mystic? Uh, yeah, I, I found it to be very, very, very cool. What do you think about the Gul'dan one? Because it kind of fell a little flat for me. It didn't look as you know epic, I think, as the Alarak one does. Uh, the Gul'dan skin, I thought it was okay. It wasn't as cool as the Alarak skin, like you said, but yeah, it, it was it was fine for a skin. It just wasn't as cool as the Alarak one. I don't play Alarak, but if I get that skin, I'm going to be jumping into some games and trying my my worst at Alarak to, to try and finish <laughs> it. Uh, have you checked out this Ravenlord comic, too? I actually read it. It wasn't too long. I read it. Some, it gives you some background on like the the rebellion of the Gravekeeper against the Ravenlord, I guess, who's the Realm Lord of Ravencourt. Have you had a chance to read that? Uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it, it looks pretty cool just because like Blizzard is just putting out more lore and stuff. So. Is this something that's going to interest you? Are you going to be getting into these comics at all? Uh, I'm going to try to because Blizzard, you know, usually they tell a pretty good story. So, you know, I'm curious to see where this goes. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And it's only like a five page comic. So I feel like I'm not spoiling a ton, but I feel like it didn't. Like, I read through the comic, and it didn't really give me as much as I wanted. It felt like it was very, like, it didn't even, like, set up the story very well. I was a little bit disappointed in it, just to be honest. I guess that's probably the best way to put it. I was expecting more buildup or maybe even just a longer comic. I guess you can't really do much with four or five pages, so it, it takes a while to get into it. But if they release these further on, maybe it will get better. But I wasn't the biggest fan. I like the art animation and style, but just the story so far I felt like lack, lacked a little bit of depth. Uh, but again, I'm sure that will come with time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's it for our news segment, which brings us into the main segment, Trolling the Nexus. We have five minutes per topic, and we've got seven topics on the docket today. We're going to start with, is Deckard strong? There's been a little bit of debate about that in different circles. We're going to talk about our Deckard build. We're going to talk about an alternative build, the Gem Deckard build. We're going to talk about his ultimates, Lornado versus Stay a While and Listen. Then we're going to talk about some of the uh, top heroes in the meta, starting with the tanks, moving on to the healers. And then we're going to have a little discussion about Maya versus Thrall and who we think is better. So without further ado, it's time to troll the Nexus, starting with Is Deckard Strong? So... Deckard has a 47.6 win rate on hot slogs last time I checked. So I guess he's quote unquote under two, but that's close enough, I think. And it's been climbing that it's probably pretty close to 50 is where it's going to settle. A lot of people originally thought and still say that he's OP, especially in the competitive circuit too. And his win rate is climbing, like I said before. So Mystic, is he strong? Like what's the situation? What do you think Deckard is? Uh, I think he has a lot of tools. Uh, the only thing that I think is uh, that's not as strong is his ability to consistently heal. You know, you have to throw it out, and his potion like projectile speed isn't exactly the fastest, nor is it the longest range. So it's kind of hard to heal the targets that you want. But the output is actually like if you can get it on the right people is actually really really good. And along with you know the the talents that he has, he's actually fairly strong. So he, he's not like super weak 
I was really disappointed in the speed of the the cast animation, I guess, or the animation uh, to get those potions on the ground. I guess, he, like, what do you expect though? He's not throwing fastballs. The guy's like a hundred <laughs> years old, but but uh, the, there and there is the the Anna effect that you can miss your heels, and those feel bad. But at least they're still around. It's like if Anna missed your heel and like whatever you missed stick stuck around somewhere for someone to pick up later. Um, there is the confusion that arises too when you throw one behind people or you missed your target, like it, someone else might pick it up. They might have like 10 health missing and they pick it up and it kind of wastes the rest of the potion because it doesn't just stick around there. Um, some of the things that I noticed, and I still am in the camp. I like, I, I, just clean slate here. I, I think he's really fun to play, but I still think he is undertuned unless you can play him really well. I think he's a very high skill cap. He's got a lot of weaknesses in my eyes. His auto attacks are probably the worst in the game. His auto attack DPS. I could be wrong, but they're pretty damn close. Uh, he's melee, so he's got to get in there to get those auto attacks done too. And you might not be wanting to do that as a healer, especially you know when your your area of effect of uh, area of denial abilities are all uh, ranged effects. Uh, his wave clear is atrocious. Uh, his burst heal is lacking too, uh, and it's hard to target those heals in a team fight, like you said. Um, uh, the other thing too is I feel like he does do a lot of healing, but I get the sense that he's a late game healer. Do you see that? Like anytime I played him, I feel like after level thirteen is where I really see that kind of power spike for Deckard, and things start going on the up for him, and he can get that really massive healing output. Uh, yeah, that's true. So at level 13, I think he does heal like a lot more. Um, he's actually, in my opinion, like a really, really good sustain healer for people early game, as long as you know, you get the potions on the right people, right? Uh, but you know, generally, that also costs a lot of mana. So he's not like, super weak early, but he is kind of on the weaker side as far as healers goes early. Well, some of the strong things he has, and he has a lot of these right out of the gate, is his CC and zone control is nuts. I mean, a lot of, like a lot of his casts are kind of slower, especially that scroll of sealing can seem like it take ages to actually unravel. But the area is large, right? And sometimes when you're fighting over a point, it doesn't really matter if it takes a long time because you deny that zone. People got to get out of it, so it's got he's got that going for him. And that healing output, like you said, like it's great for that point control. Uh, so he so he has that really great ability to put out a lot of healing if you're staying in one spot. That kind of like Gaslow effect, right? Like if you have time to set up, you can do a lot. Uh, he also set those crazy combos too, like stay a while and listen, or even his scroll of ceiling too, right? Um, like wh where do you feel like Deckard fits like in terms of like maps? Like are there certain maps he's strong on? Is it just the zone control maps like your Hanamuras maybe and your Braxises, or are there other places that he shines as well? Uh, he's really strong on Braxis just because, you know, no one can get to him really because he, he has that like Morales effect. Um, on maps, I think where point control as well because with point control, right, he's a he's a, kind of a zoning support, so he can do that too. But another thing that I wasn't expecting, like, was how good of a combo his cube into like his uh, scroll of ceiling is. Like, if you don't react instantly the moment you get hit by the cube with his uh his like scroll of ceiling coming out you're going to get rooted and that's really that's really kind of insane for combo comps because from that root you can either get a pick off or some other piece of the combo goes in they get cc'd again or they take a lot of damage and uh he he's just really good at zone control or just like any combos in general i think i wish his scroll of Job ceiling done was a triangle in the opposite direction because the pointy end is always away from you. I wish it was towards you because I guess maybe when you're trying to peel for yourself or your team, you want the fat down on your side, but it'd be nice to have the fat on the other side when you're trying to do something more aggressive. That tri that triangle is kind of an awkward shape. It's almost too bad you can't like vector target it or something. I'm sure they probably tested that and found it wasn't the greatest. Okay, yeah. so we have a Deckard build. We were originally going to have mystics build and daz's build but we we went over it before the show and we're like hey our deckard builds are actually kind of similar uh so we're gonna go through and talk about our build and say why we think it's strong uh so i'll go through the build starting with level one uh we've got field study we both thought was pretty powerful 15 percent spell power for 14 seconds for each hero hit with scroll of ceiling and you can stack it up to 30 percent spell power 
Now, spell power also affects healing, so this affects healing output. Why is this strong, Mystic, do you think, compared to the other talents on this tier? Uh, I think it's strong just because it does affect healing, and, you know, early on, he isn't exactly, like, the best healer, so he, he does need that healing number increase, and I think with this, if you, like, get it off and throw out a bunch of healing, it just makes his healing that much stronger early that, uh, you know, he can pick that up, snowball that into, like, kind of... Uh, middle middle to late game i guess here and when are you going to be hitting heroes with your scroll of ceiling it's going to be when you're in a team fight when you need that output the most so getting 15 even 30 percent bonus healing just seems hella powerful i remember when i started first thought, i was like why would you ever take this his damage is horrible but it's not for the damage <laughs> it's for the healing level four we disagreed a little bit here maybe it's a situational pick i said i like rejuvenation potion Gives you an additional heal over time and mana back to whoever picks up the potions. You like Potion of Shielding, which gives some extra shielding that can go above your maximum health. So you get that extra little bit there to mitigate the burst. Why did you choose Potion of Shielding over Rejuvenation Potion? You think they're both good, just in different situations? I think they're both good. I chose Potion of Shielding just because my play style of healer is... Everybody on my team is at 100% HP all the time. So if, you know, you take a little bit of damage or something, I'm, I'm throwing you that potion. And even if it overheals you, it's going to give you that shielding as well. So whereas, like, if I threw your rejuvenation potion, sure, you'd get the mana. But, like, all that he additional healing over time or something like that probably be wasted. So if I threw you a potion of shielding, though, you would get that... Um, you get that healing, the overheal a little bit would be wasted, but you also get the shield, in which case, you know, if you got hit by anything for the next six seconds, which, you know, is kind of likely in uh, in poke wars or, you know, just like before pre-battles, then it's actually really useful. I'm thinking what I generally do, I, I definitely think potion shielding is a place. I default to rejuvenation potion just to get that extra output. Um, and because you get the healing over time, I know it's not the greatest for burst, but even in like a long sustained team fight, which I feel like is where you're generally taking Deckard anyways, you get that extra healing output uh, because the shield is wasted if the person's not taking damage when they have that shield because it only lasts for, I don't know what it is, four seconds or something. Uh, uh, six seconds. Quite six a long seconds. Time, actually. That is a long time. Uh, potion of shielding, however, when that helps mitigate one of his deficiencies. When you're in those team fights and you need that burst heal, that, that helps. The heal over time doesn't help when you're dead, right? Whereas a shield will help prevent you from dying in the first place, potentially. Yeah. Level 7, we both said Kainai's kin kin Cube? I don't know how to say it. But what it does is it reduces 30% damage reduction for 4 seconds to enemy heroes hit with your Heradric Cube. Uh, I didn't Originally, I will. I like the gem on this level because it reduces healing output, but then I started playing around with it, and I settled on Kainai's Cube. Easy to do. You don't have to worry about having extra numbers, and 30% damage reduction works in almost all situations because when your people are trying to kill you, they're doing damage. Yep, yep. Easy to use. Just throw it, fire and forget. Easy spell. N enough said. <laughs> we're going to skip the albums because we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Level 13. This is I, I'm going to argue this with Mystic here because I love Ancient Blessings. I talked about it last episode we had as well. You activate your trait, makes your trait activatable to empower your auto attacks of and that of nearby allies for eight seconds. You get bonus AoE damage. It procs every one, at least after every one second, so there's an internal cooldown. And you get healing as well. This talent i think is insane you pop it over at a boss fight or like when you're in a deep engage and everyone starts healing themselves everyone starts doing crazy aoe damage deckard actually does respectable damage i used to clear lanes occasionally i know there's not a team fight breaking out because it's actually a low cooldown too and people are like i'll be like don't worry guys deckard's got that lane i'll go up there i'll clear the lane come down meet up with the team or something i think it's an amazing versatile talent that can really turn a team fight and surprise everybody but the rest of the team needs to know that you're doing it to make it effective uh mystic went with potion of revival which i wish was on a different tier because it's also a very strong one uh job's the done the problem with uh potion of revival is that it's up against ancient blessings in my eyes potion of revival will heal nearby allies for 30 percent 
of the original amount if it's been left on the floor for a couple of seconds. So Mystic, tell me why you don't take Ancient Blessings as your go-to here. Uh, typically, it's because I play in a more non-team-oriented environment right now. So Potion of Revival, it was the kind of halfway point between, hey, my team's all spread out all over the place where Ancient Blessings would only hit like me and one other person. And Potion of Revival, it's like, well, during like the second or two that they are next to me, I can heal everybody up. Very true. And I mean, Ancient of the Blessings, it's very subtle. Like people will not know if it's activated unless you tell them. So I feel like comms is almost a must. You can't even ping to, to communicate that. But it just is so hella strong if you are in that controlled environment, I think, that it's kind of hard not to go that route. Level 16, no argument here from me, no argument here from Mystic. We all said Heradric Staff. Every five seconds, your melee attacks give a 0.75 second stun. Now, I was thinking about it, and immediately I was like, you know what? This is very similar to what Uther does with his E. So I looked it up. Uther's E, Hammer of Justice, is a 0.75 second stun as well, but it's on a longer cooldown. It's point and click, but it's short range, basically melee range. So you're basically getting yourself a free Uther E by going Heradric Staff. This is a very powerful talent, don't you think, Mystic? Yeah, it's very powerful, especially for Peel, hitting the tank or something, if, you know, they're they're attacking you. And, I don't know, like, in my opinion, I think safety in numbers has its place. But, uh, yeah, I don't know about Scroll of Stone Curse, personally. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people going uh, the safety numbers, too, because you do get bonus cooldown reduction when you've got multiple people around you, like three, I think. Uh, but still, Heradric Staff just is good in so many situations. It's kind of hard not to use it. You got a Genji, whack him on the head. The Genji stun, like, you take Uther to counter Genji for like pretty much the same reason. You got a point and click stun, right? All of a sudden, I know it's a little bit later game, but level 16, you got the exact same uh, thing that Uther does to counter a lot of dive. Mm. Level 20. Now, I think we both had this the same two that we picked here. We picked two because one is ultimate dependent. Uh, respect the elderly. Uh, that's, after, that's a stay a while and listen upgrade. After everyone wakes up, they get silence for two seconds and they get blinded for two seconds as well. Bottomless Flask is the other one we both chose, and I'd choose this if I didn't take Stay a While and Listen. And that's where, after someone drinks a potion, it'll reappear in the same reappear in the same spot after five seconds. So you can drastically increase your healing output using Bottomless Flask, but Respect the Elderly is also really strong. Missy, do you want to talk about these two? Uh, well, Respect the Elderly is really strong just because, well, you know, if you hit anybody with it, they're silenced and blinded for two seconds after waking up from sleep, then that just means, you know, they can't do anything for two seconds after they wake up from sleep. So that, that's already very strong, especially if you hit multiple targets in it. Bottomless Flask, like you said, it's extra healing, but I don't know if you really need this per se, like, or need to use it in this way but it also means that if you put like let's just say one potion top lane one potion in mid lane one potion bot lane you always have healing anywhere kind of on the field as long as you don't like cast too many more potions and you know the people know how to use them i i i love when i'm running around the map i'm like oh hey there's a potion just hanging out here it's like a free <laughs> little like almost like a mana regen globe right of essentially the same amount of man uh healing you get back uh it's always a nice little surprise uh but bottomless flask i gotta say just in defense of your potion revival level 13 those two synergize so well because you get the bonus healing if it sits on the floor for a long time plus it comes back too that can really boost his healing output but so you're hard hard set to tear me away from ancient blessings respect the elderly though Having that silence and blind makes it feel a lot less bad if you mess up your combo or everyone else around you wakes up the people from their, their sleep, which is really easy to do. At least they're silenced and blinded for two seconds. So essentially, they can't do anything no matter what hero they are. That's a pretty powerful combination, silence and blind, because it works for everybody. So anyhow, I think we'll move along to the next topic, which is gem build Deckard. So... Gem build Deckard. You want you want me to you want to run me through here what the gem build is, like uh, Mystic, and uh, tell tell me what you think about him. 
All right, so the gem build here, it's typically a late game build. It does a little bit less healing than, you know, the typical healing build because it goes for more, like, uh, utility. I mean, there's a little bit of healing here and there, but it's mostly there's cubes everywhere. And, you know, all the cubes do different abilities because of the gems. So at level one, we choose Sapphire. Haradra cube slows for an extra 25%. Very useful. It's We choose it because it's a gem. At uh, level 4, we have Ruby. Roger Cube spawns three lesser health potions for every hero hit, which is also really good whether you're diving or they're diving. So, you know, it, there's a little bit of healing there. We also choose it because it's a gem. At level 7 here, you can choose... There's uh, two options here, but, you know, typically because it's gem build, kind of choose the gem. Uh, Herodric, for Emerald, level 7, or heroes hit by Haradra Cube have their healing reduced by 75% for 4 seconds. So it's really good healing reduction. The other one you could potentially choose here is uh, Cube Mastery, but, you know. So at level 10, Situational Ultimate. At level 13, you pick Super Healing Potion because um, it powers up your lesser healing potions as well and, you know, your other potions. So Super Healing Potion, if potions aren't picked up for at least 2 seconds, they heal 75% more. And like I was saying, it powers up the lesser healing potions. At level 16, you take safety in numbers. So if there are at least three allies nearby, you gain an additional 10 armor and recharge abilities an additional 50% faster. This allows you for faster potion casting and for more cubes, which you need for the gems. Um, and level 20, you take perfect gems, which reduce gem cooldowns by all the gem cooldowns that you have. By 25 seconds, they're typically 30 seconds, so they're on 5 second cooldown now. And Herodric Cube gets reduced by 5 seconds, which takes it from, uh, let's see here. It takes it from 14 to 9, which is, you know, kind of respectable cooldown there. And it allows you to just spam your gems more. So I, I just want to correct a mistake that I made. Because when we're talking about our Deckard build, for some reason, I thought you were talking when at level uh, 13 with Potion of Revival. I thought that was uh, Super Healing Potions the whole time I was talking about it. So I totally got mixed up there. So when I was talking about synergies and stuff, just pretend like I was talking about Super Healing Potions. You actually like the AoE Potion Heal. Uh, I gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Because uh, Super <laughs> Healing Potions is the bigger potions. The Potion of Revival is the AoE heal when you pick up a potion. Anyways, yeah. the, let's talk gem build. So... Uh, I one of the reasons I don't like gem build is because if you take a lot of gems, you can only use one at a time. So it's very like I know you've got a lot of utility, but you can't like if you take different level one, four, and seven talents, they're always going to be active. Like whenever you cast abilities, and you can use whatever those beneficial effects are all the time. Whereas here, you got to make a choice, and you can't do two in a row unless like you know you, you wait a second for like the the gem to come off cooldown so you can't just keep spamming the same one over and over again until you get to level 20 so just to me it seems like it was kind of clunky it's a lot higher skill cap too because generally like you don't want to pre-select your one two and three uh your what gem you want to use you want to do it right before the cast which can you know lead to a combo a finger combo which can get a little bit more complicated too uh do you think is it just like higher skill cap or is this just like a worse build uh i think what you're talking about like, yes, that's true, but that's just, like, part of the build, right? It's a late-game build, so it has to, like, ramp. Like you said, you know, you can only cast, like, one at a time, typically. But later on in the build, there is the um, the super healing potion, which increases the effectiveness of the ruby one. And then the safety numbers, which allows you to cast cubes more often. And then, obviously, the perfect gems, which allows you to cast, like, a lot of cubes. So it... I just think it's just part of the ramp process. It's like it's just not as good early, but you know, as you get later and later, it becomes much better. It seems like it really picks up at level twenty, and you hate to see when builds do that. A la Nazebo, <laughs> like just <laughs> just wait to twenty, and then Deckard becomes a healing or a crazy utility machine. I guess having that Herodric cube cooldown, plus you can pretty much pick any time he wants whenever he's using them too. Um, so I don't know. It seems too late game for me. I hate late game heroes like waiting for it like it's not too bad if it's like a level 13 level 16 talent t uh, level spike but the level 21 where it really comes online seems to be a bit hard i mean i guess this still is level 13 Job's talent done. Spike, but still yeah okay 
moving on to the next topic, we've got Lornado or Stay a While. So I'm interested to see what Mystic has to say here. So why don't we move along to Mystic? Uh, I mean, the pick rates are pretty close. They're uh, 55% for Stay a While, 45% for Lornado. And the win rate, though, is a little little bit higher for Stay a While and Listen. So Mystic, what do you think is the more powerful pick here? Uh, I think for me, they're like 50-50, honestly. There's, there's just pros and cons to each one. Like... Um, Stay a while and listen is very strong in like combo oriented um, kind of composition. So I'm sure a lot of people knew that. And it also works. It also works really well as a zoning tool where you could just throw it down and then any any people that come in, you know, just get instantly put to sleep. You can also throw it out and then put to sleep the people that you need to and then instantly cancel. So that means, you know, you can go on healing while they're still asleep for two seconds. You don't need to sit there channeling, especially if like you put down the sleep somebody instantly broke your sleep and you're just like, well, I don't want to be sitting here for the next like two seconds channeling when my spell no longer does anything. Remember you you can't move to cancel it either. You have to press the uh, ultimate button. So remember that, that that's really huge. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Lornado. I think Lornado is like really, really good just for more reasons than initial zone control, because you look at the spell and you're like, okay, what, what does it do? Well, it throws down a, kind of tornado thing that zones pushes people's away pushes people away or pulls people closer so what it also does is that it kind of like knocks people back for like a half a half second or something and this is really really good for interrupting spell casts like if you throw your lornado like right in front of a kalthos like pushing him kind of away if he's trying to cast like let's just say flame strike he'll walk up start like to press the Q button, get pushed away, and then it'll give him that like mini stun. So then he won't cast it. And he's like, okay, well, where'd my flame strike go? Oh, I got hit by the tornado. I can't cast it. And if it constantly hits them, like if it hits them multiple times, then they really can't cast anything. It's like the same thing as like a uh, Chen, Chen Keg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where they can't do anything when they're getting knocked back by Chen Keg. Oh, God. I've, I've got nightmares <laughs> of Chen rolling around, knocking me back as Li Ming trying to you know e away and you can't do anything because that interrupt yeah my initial thoughts on lornado was that it was going to be well i thought initially it was gonna be strong and then i started playing with it i thought it was pretty bad but i've come around on it i think it's actually the stronger of the two to be honest with you um the problem i have with lornado at first was that it takes a second after you cast it for the actual tornado to appear and a lot can happen in a second but like you said, there's there's reasons that you can use it that are easily predictable. You see Nazebo doing um, his ravenous spirit, or Kalthos doing a pyroblast wind up. Like you can cast those, get the interrupts from a safe distance as well. And there's also so many interesting ways that people have been using Lornado too. The one that I like is when you're when you're trying to run away, you cast it a little bit away from yourself in the direction that you're running and you point it in the direction that you're going because then you can run through it and and people basically can't catch you if you if you if you're running away and you throw it in the opposite direction it might knock them back once but then you can just walk around it and they'll be fine but if you're walking with it it actually kind of body blocks for you along the way which is an amazing i think way to go about it and not to mention it's cool that's only 45 seconds so you you can use it pretty freely you know it's going to be up in most team fights and you don't feel so bad about missing it uh, not to mention boss steel potential too, which is always a great oh, thing yeah. to have. You toss it down the point, knock everybody back. And when and the funny thing is too, when you use it in the boss, I feel like everyone is like so panicked to get on the point that they don't move around it. They just keep trying to move back into it. Maybe it was just people I was playing against, uh, but people, <laughs> people who learn to move around it later, but that's just me. Uh, stay well. I think it's an amazing, like, even just peel, too. Like, you don't need to use it to set up the wombos necessarily, and those are hard to pull off because it's so easy to interrupt the sleep. Um, but that being said, like, you put people to sleep, then you can run away, they're still sleeping, you can save your team that way. You don't have to do it as a setup. You can use a peel as well. You can do it from behind bushes or behind terrain and can still catch people. It can, it can work pretty well, especially the level 20 upgrade. I like the level 20. I feel like it makes it a lot more forgiving as well what mm. what combos do you like to set up with stay a while are there any ones that you like in particular uh some of the ones that i like are stay a while listen into mosh pit into planet cracker that one <laughs> is uh pretty pretty popular 
People love them. They're um, planet crackers. Yeah, other ones are Stay a While and Listen into Diablo Old or Diablo Old into Stay a While and Listen. Those are kind of you know interchangeable Job's there. done. And uh, yeah, th- those are pretty awesome. I'm going to extend time here a little bit because there's one thing that I also want to talk about, and that's just drafting with Deckard. What kind of comps do you like Deckard in? And what comps do you like to counter Deckard, uh, Mystic? Hmm. Well... I guess uh, we'll start off with which ones uh, he's good in, right? So he's good in, obviously, combo, wombo comps, any of those. And he's good in, like, either compositions where your team already has a little bit of sustain, so, you know, you don't need to rely solely on potions, or just, like, kind of poke compositions where they won't take, like, too much damage, early on at least. So with like a poke comp, like people take damage here and there, even though they're like Chromie or something, they're really long range. Uh, he can heal that up pretty easily, actually. And then compositions where your team already has a little bit of self healing means he doesn't need to heal as much, and he can focus on like zone control, rooting, you know, setting up for other combos and stuff like that. I agree. The sustain heals, I think, is are his real strengths. So whenever you're setting up a comp that relies on just being able to have massive healing throughput uh either holding a point or just that's your style like you're not necessarily a dive comp i think that's the way to go um dive is tough with deckard i think to to counter um the only thing i mean if, if you're diving if you're a god team that comp that dives the other team i think maybe you have good setup with uh something like a stay in a stay a while or your your scroll of ceiling but that still like he's he doesn't have a lot of mobility so it can be kind of difficult and he can't really save people but he might help enable dive a bit um what do you think about counters like how would you counter if you saw a deckard come out how would you counter that would you just draft dive is that your thoughts is what i'd probably do uh counters i'd say either like instant blow up so you know his you just instantly blow up a target and his potions you know they only heal like once every two or so seconds just because uh you know he can't burst heal that hard or a lot of displacement like a kerrigan or etc or something where you grab targets or even grab deckard because he doesn't you're saying he doesn't have that much mobility so he can't like get to the target as fast or you know he can't get out if uh, you grab him one thing actually i kind of i noticed i was playing blaze against deckard and you can cast bunker if you cast it before you fall asleep it, you'll still pop into it <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the what the interaction is with sleep because not a lot of heroes have it, but does it not interrupt casting abilities? Like if someone's casting something and they fall asleep, will they will the cast still go off? Because bunker does. Maybe bunker's different because like you're you're kind of like summoning the bunker, so it kind of comes down where it's not like a channeled cast. Um, but still, I thought that was kind of an interesting interaction. Uh, I think sleep works almost exactly like as if you got stunned. So if you you know. I think if Blaze gets hit by Murden Q as he's casting Bunker, I think the Bunker still comes down. Okay, so So it's just me not knowing how Bunker works, I guess. All right, well, uh, some interesting thoughts there. And I guess the final question I have on that, and I guess we're spending about five minutes on the sidebar, so it should be its own topic. Um, But what about double healer or like even like an off healer with Deckard? Um, I've heard people say something like Medivh is actually not something you want to do with Deckard because you're gimping your damage output too much because Deckard does not have damage. So yeah, great if you got two healers there, but like where's the damage going to come from? I I agree with that sentiment. If you were to tell me, hey, I'm going to take Deckard as a solo healer, I'm going to be like, okay, I mean, he can he can solo heal. I'd say he's like, literally on the edge of that that he can solo heal between he can solo heal so that's that's just like early on though like later on once he gets his tools yeah he can definitely solo heal but like early on it's like okay so we're gonna be pressed for healing a little bit early on but you know so we just gotta get it get through this rough patch before you know we can actually have a uh, quite a bit of healing so i, I draft him that way yeah i like the idea you had before too you mentioned like having heroes with a little bit of self-sustain to help out the burden on on deckard's healing throughput in a team fight situation like you know your thralls or your gul'dans or whatever heroes that can take care of themselves a little bit to give themselves that augmented healing and i think that's where you should go instead of the double healer route if that's the kind of thing you're trying to think about doing with your deckard Mm -hmm. 
Okay, next topic, we've got Top Dog Tank. So we're going to be talking about the top tanks, who we think the top tanks are in the meta and why. Where's Liquid? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> he was supposed to be here for this topic, but anyways, there's going to be, you got me and Mystic here. So just looking at win rates, Diablo is a cut above right now. He's at 51, almost 52% win rate. Then you got Johanna, Varian, and Arthas around 50%. Stitches at 49, and then you got a bunch of a clump around 48%. Murdered and Garrosh, ETC, Blaze, and then Tyrael's even lower at 46%. I didn't keep the bruisers in here. I was just talking about, like, main tanks. I think that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, you know, we're going to omit your Sonyas and Leorics of the world. Um, so, like, what is Diablo just top tier? Is that is as simple as that? Or, like, should you be taking Diablo in all situations? He does, his win rate seems to show it and it seems like people when I'm playing are drafting him like he's the top priority pick tank and if you don't get him you got a second rate tank I mean he really is because what, well, what does Diablo bring to the table he brings 30% of like any anybody's HP which is really strong he also brings hey massive HP pool he can just take a lot of soak and he brings engage so it's like the only thing that you'd want else from a tank is like maybe a lot of interrupts but uh you know he's he kind of does that like a little bit just because apoc you know they have to move and he has flip so flips not on like a super short cooldown but it it's enough sometimes who would you put in the second tier um like hot Slog is telling us varian johanna and arthas are those is as simple as that those are the three or are there other ones you like here uh, I really like Varian. I, I'd say Arthas is a good solo tank if like. Yeah, your gray mains and such. Yeah, on exactly. Side. Like he's a situational, he's a situational like really really good solo tank against Illidan, gray main. You know, like melee auto attackers. Arthas is great. I think same with Johanna. Although Johanna is a little bit more versatile, where she does have the blind too for like the anti AA, but she also has like a lot of self healing and a lot more stuns than Arthas does. Varian, I'd say he's up there just because of his like how uh, you know how often his taunt comes up and he can just charge a lot with uh, his Warbringer talent. I think that's called. I was but having, other than that. Yeah, I was having a lot of fun with like taking Warbringer at ten and and taunt. I feel like it's always up and it feels like just another basic ability. Um, what about ETC though? I know Mystic would or Liquid would have an argument for ETC, but his win rate is a little bit lower. Is he still up there in terms of your tier here? I think Murden, Garage, ETC, Blaze, they're all, I think, still strong. It's just the only reason that their win rates are a little bit lower right now is because people, like, they, they were picked so often. And now people, like, they, they kind of get this thing, or the community kind of gets into this thing where it's like, oh, all these heroes are picked very often, so we know how to play against them much because we play against them much more frequently we just like know how to play around them right whereas uh diablo he was he's kind of like behind these heroes before and now he's in front of these heroes because uh he wasn't being as picked as much as you know these ones and now these ones are behind him so the other thing i don't understand is how you look at all these tanks and the only one with a plus 50 percent win rate you know more or less is diablo and like shouldn't all of your tanks more or less average out to about 50 percent this is telling me that you know you're you're losing more often than you're winning with tanks i guess you know it kind of muddies the waters because you usually usually have two tanks so it depends on the two that you take and stuff or if you're taking solo tank versus dual tank but it just seems strange to me that almost all of them are below 50 percent except for like one or two uh yeah that is kind of weird but they're all kind of hovering around 50% except for Tyrael because he, <laughs> he's not really like a main tank, if you ask me. He's kind of like a support tank. That's so. true. And it's not like all these heroes are, are being played the same amount. So if it's a weighted average, I'm sure it'd be probably closer to 52 just because Diablo is played probably so much more than all these other heroes. I mean, I don't, I don't have the numbers right up here in front of me, but I'm sure he's the most popular tank by far. Um, so how about, like, what about Muradin? Like, I mean, you kind of talked about him a little bit, but... I remember the days when he was one of the top tanks, but he, a lot of people, you know, cringe when they see a Murden pick these days. Uh, I still think Murden is strong in the right hands. Um, I think 
he's not as strong as Diablo, I guess, just because, well, one, people have figured out how to deal with him because he was top dog, you know, uh, a while ago. Job's and done. the fact that uh, Murden has to actually, like, hit spells where Diablo just goes in and he clicks charges target, and... yeah he clicks you and you you get charged <laughs> and later not to mention the damage diablo can do can be pretty nuts yeah okay so next we're going to be talking about the top healer we've already talked about the top tank let's move on to healer uh right now you look at hot slogs lily is up there a year ago i don't think i'd ever thought i'd be saying that she's at 54 percent win rate uh, next pack on Hot Slogs would be Brightwing, Morales, and Stukov, all around 51%. And then you got a bit more of a clustered pack between about 485 to 50%. That's Karazim, Anna, Alex Straza, Lucia, Rhaegar, Uther, and Malfurion. So Lili, is she worthy of being the top? Should you always be picking Lili here, Mystic? I don't think you should always be picking Lili, but she's very strong for just, you know, what she does. Like Why, why, she's... why? <laughs> That's one of those ones I just don't understand why she's that strong. Well, she's she's one of the healers that didn't get nerfed in, like, the healer apocalypse, really. So, And then they gave her some more tools on top of that. So not only does she provide, like, quite a bit of utility here, she also provides, like, a lot of healing compared to, like, a lot of healers for... Like, it's kind of easy healing, too, right? You just hold down the Q button, and then, you know, it, it heals. And then, you know, her ultimate, uh, Jugs, is, like, it's really strong when you need healing, and it also has the added benefit of, hey, you know, if you're a little bit of a better Lili player than your, you know, average player, you know that you can cancel it, and so that just adds a little bit of extra thing there. And if she doesn't need that, well, she can pick Water Dragon, and Water Dragon's not exactly weak. You know, it, it actually slows quite a bit. Yeah, I feel like Lili's very situational like you're saying too if, you, if you're coming up against a lot of AA on the other team then she makes sense because those blinds get a lot more value um, but she is missing a little bit I mean like Jugs can be argued as that kind of saving type ultimate it is a little bit slower than something like an Ancestral in terms of getting that bat massive burst but boy can it make a big difference and while she's you know an easier quote unquote healer to play um, still like the, I, I think that you know she's not picked in all the situations just she when she is picked situationally she is strong what about the next round like I if if I had to make a choice I'd stay Stukov and Malfurion even though Malfurion sub 50 would be highly contested at least from what I've been seeing um, then a little bit below them I'd say even like Lucio um, would probably be close to that pack what do you think is your tier list here if you went for like top you know just general healers you know not thinking about lili uh i think brightwing's still strong um he's a little bit more niche i think but he's still pretty strong i'm surprised morales is up here like you know up at 51 percent uh i i mean i like morales but i personally don't think she's like insanely strong or anything uh stukov yeah this is about right like stukov is actually really strong the other ones um i mean there were a couple nerfs, like Malf got nerfed, Uther's been there for a while, I think people are learning how to deal with him. Rhaegar, I think Rhaegar needs a little bit of something to get him up there, like, he kind of just does a little bit of everything, he's not, like, strong in any super category, like, he used to be the tank healer because of his ancestral, but now, you know, he's like, Still his can't. ancestral is like, eh, yeah. I still can't believe he can't self-cast that, when they took that away, yeah. it was a sad day. So, like, who would be your, your top-tier healers then? Like, I'd, I'd probably say Stukov and Malf if I had to pick two. But I even even above that, I'd say Stukov's probably better in most situations, whereas Malf not only is a higher skill cap hero, but you, I feel like you generally benefit if you have a lot more melee on the other team so you can hit those multiple moon fires. But, like, what's your, what are your thoughts on, like, the top dogs here? I think I think I honestly think Lily is up there just because uh, she does so much for having so little. Um, Stugov is also really high up there. I think right below that would be like Uther, Malf, because I I personally think Uther is still very strong. Malfurion is also very strong. Uh, do I put Alex Straza on that tier? Mm, yeah, let's let's put Alex Straza on that tier. I just think I think Alex Straza is still very strong. Lucio is not as good just because of um, the release of, like, Maev and a bunch of these, like, kind of people that 
mess you up if you get too close, and Lucio kind of has to get semi-close to heal. Uh, Rhaegar, I think Rhaegar's still okay, but he's not as strong just because what I said earlier. And then Kerzim, Ana is kind of like on the lower tier. Not to say that they're super bad, but... Is, is, it, is it safe to say that healers are in a good spot outside of maybe a couple here in that you can pick them in the right situations to make them more powerful? I mean, like, Ana can really shine in some situations too, right? Like, I like playing Ana even with, like, a Diablo or, Job's or, done. or another high health target like a Cho'Gal or a Garrosh too. I find that she can be really strong a couple of that armor. She can really get a lot of healing out on someone like a Garrosh, making him basically unkillable. Or, like, your Uther. Like, you know, he doesn't have a high healing output, but he does provide that utility, a counter dive. Like, he does have a spot. It seems like almost every healer has a bit of a spot and isn't as generalist as maybe they used to be. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, yeah. Okay, and then finally, we're going to be talking about Maiev and Thrall. If they were duking out in the ring, who'd be the victor? It'll be interesting to see what Mystic thinks. I know what I think, but maybe we'll start with you, Mystic. Who who do you like here, Thrall or Maiev? Because they're both hovering around the similar win rate, 53%. They both do a lot of similar things. They both have some differences, though, as well. So what do you like of these two, and who do you like better in most situations? Uh, I mean, if you were to ask me just straight up, who's better, my ever Thrall? I'd have to say it depends, because um, we have Thrall who Pick has a, a winner, of... Mystic. Enough of this 50-50, I don't know, sitting uh, on the I'm fence getting stuff? There. I'm getting there. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 I'll lay off for a sec. I'll let you, I'll let you talk. So Thrall, we have a lot of poke and sustain, right? But he's not that tanky. And then for Maiev, she's a lot tankier, and she has a lot of engage, but she lacks a sustain or poke, right? Now, if you were to ask, now if you were to say, okay, so then which one would you have on your team? Like you know, everything else kind of evened out. I'd probably say the Thrall, just because he's easier to play. And while Maiev does have like the big oh, here's the cage, right? Then if you don't get off like that good of a cage, then Maiev just, I feel like kind of falls flat. Because right now she like goes in, she pulls someone, maybe, you know, if they're not cleansed or something or unstoppable, then, and if she doesn't get CC to death, then the only thing else that she has is that she can throw a Q, right? And then there's the conditional factor that if it hits two people, then she can throw another Q. But if she doesn't, well, then she's out of spells and she can't really go in an auto attack that much anymore because they reduce her tankiness so much. Thrall, on the other hand, can just like throw a chain lightning, throw a chain lightning, throw a chain lightning. You know, uh, he can do that from a safe distance. He has the CC of his wolf. And if they get in close, then he can pop his wind fury. And not only that, but his, his, both of his ultimates are really good. Earthquake for like any situation where they have really slow, less mobile heroes. And then the um, the Sundering for like Wombo Combo or just like if you really want to kill a Squishy. So I think Thrall. Correct answer. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I like Thrall as well. Uh, for most reasons that you said here as well, I feel like he just does most things well. The one downside i think i think my abs can have a higher damage throughput in a team fight especially if there's a lot of melee heroes because she can spam that q um but i like thrall i love earthquake i love being able to get into that fight slowing everyone saying hey if you want to fight here you're going to be fighting through molasses and not only that but thrall's getting you know lots of heals off of it too um, the fact that he can sit there, he can take care of himself, take that burden off the healer, I think it makes him very powerful. Obviously, Maev has a couple tricks up her sleeve as well. She's got her, uh, whatever the shadow moving is called and everything too. And Warden's Cage is cute, but I think it's a lower, uh, a worse version of Earthquake, to be honest with you. See, um, when Maev first came out, I had this like trouble about her because I was just like, okay, I don't like your kit that much. Just because I, I don't think it'll be that good. But when she was released, the only reason she was very strong was because her numbers were super inflated. And, like, you know, they just flat out beat everybody else just because she could just walk at you. And then she just spams all of her buttons and she wins just because her numbers are too high. 
But now, now that her numbers are kind of like a reasonable level, like now you have to look at her kit, right? And you have to see what she actually does. And Warden's Cage, I'm going to say, it is a lot better than, you know, I expected when I initially thought about it. But um, yeah, the rest of the stuff, kind of like what I thought would happen. It's like her kit is okay. It's not like super great. So is it safe to say like generally Thrall's the pick if you had, if you had to choose between the two for whatever reason, but Maiev is a situational pick? And like what situations would you take her over Thrall? Is it just when you need that hard engage and you maybe you yeah. have a lot of healing output already so you don't have to worry about being as tanky, I guess, with the heals and the self-sustain? Yeah, that's correct. I would go in, like I'd pick Maiev if I needed like a super hard engage because she'd go in, she'd W, and then she'd put up the, the cage, right? It's like that. that's her super hard engage. Other than that, she has like her Q that's situationally okay in damage. So then, yeah, she doesn't have much other than that because they took away a lot of her tankiness too. All right. And that's going to do it for trolling the Nexus today. Uh, so we're finally going to finish off the show with Mystic's Shakedown. So Mystic, shake it down for us. Mystic, I require a service of you. I come to you as a friend, asking you to shake down this situation for me. So Mystic, what are we talking about today, bud? Well, I'm going to be talking about uh, using cooldowns. So, you know, casting your spells and whatnot. So, for lower, level, for lower levels of play, this is what I've noticed. Is that, you know, team goes in, and fight happens, and then, you know, some people die, some people get away, and, you know, you look at what people have, and they still have spells on their, you know, on their screen that they have not used. Like, let's just say Kael'thas going in there, and then he walks away or something, the team fight's over, and you look at his spells, and he still has, like, his gravity lapse, he still has his flame strike, and he still has his phoenix. It's like, well, you could have used those in that fight. <laughs> um, so for, I'm thinking for lower levels of play here, and it, uh, a piece of advice would just be, just make sure to use your spells. Like, sure, there is a perfect situation that could possibly line up for, you know, maximum value on your spells, but typically... If you make sure to cast every single one of your spells in like a semi-decent way, it doesn't have to be like super good, but make sure it's not like, oh, I just throw it over to the side just for the heck of it. Um, generally, you're going to be doing a lot more than your opponents doing that. Because if you throw out your spell, and let's just say it has a value of like three or something, where your opponent just didn't use a spell, then you've got that plus three, right, on your team compared to their zero. Now, for higher levels of play, I know that it's a lot different there because people know that, hey, I need to use my spells for it to have any benefit in a fight or, you know, in the game, right? So what you need to do at higher levels of play is not only to cast your spells in a better way, but you want to play around your heroic cooldowns as soon as they come up. Like, let's just say Phoenix, right? Uh, I'm using Kael'thas for an example again. But Phoenix, let's just say it just came up, right? So you want to use it like you say, okay, team, I have Phoenix. Hey, can we set up a way for me to use my Phoenix really effectively right here? So you go in or or even like try to go for a pick. You know that uh, there's this guy coming in for the soak bottom lane. You go in, gravity laps Phoenix, just throw it out and make sure you use that. If you get the kill, that's great. If you don't, well, you know, it, that's just the way the cookie crumbles there but making sure that you use them off cooldown. And if your opponents aren't doing the, the same thing, then that just means like, you know, you're getting maybe two of your heroics for their one, right? Um, then there, there kind of is a balancing act between getting the best value off of your cooldowns and when to cast them. But that's what makes, you know, the difference between good players and great players is that they're really good at balancing the best value and when to cast their abilities. I think one thing to be careful of here, especially when, you know, you're giving the advice of saying just spam those abilities. I mean, in a team fight, maybe it's a different situation, but mana management is actually a fairly important thing, especially when you're in lane, say, in like a laning phase. Um, one thing that I've been personally trying to work on is optimizing mana usage and being like, hey, I'm in a four-man rotation. We're clearing waves. I'm Jaina. Do I really need to cast 
a blizzard if we're going to clear the wave in half a second anyways, right, to kind of conserve mana. Um, so I think that when you're using spells, especially like when you're not in a team fight situation, the, the last thing you want to do is have to back or find yourself in a team fight with no mana because you've been using everything willy nilly. <laughs> And I can't believe I just said that, but willy nilly. Um, yeah, so that's that's the only thing I'd like to addend, addend, append. I don't know. <laughs> Put in there to to your your advice, which is always great, Mystic. Wait, Daz, but we're in a day and age where mana doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> yes, if you're sure. on a manless hero, obviously ignore anything I said because it doesn't matter there. <laughs> okay time to end the show i'm gonna thank our chieftain super dave as always for pledging his support to the trolls uh, if you would like to be a chieftain just like super dave and get a shout out at the end of every show you can head over to patreon.com slash trolls gg and do- donate above a certain threshold value I-, I still don't know what that is but a certain threshold value says on the patreon page to become a chieftain you'll get a shout out not only on this show but also on troll and hgc the podcast about HGC that we also do on the Trolls.gg network. Thank you everyone for listening to the Nexus Trolls, a Heroes of the Storm podcast. We stream this live on this Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash trollsgg every week on Thursdays at 7.30pm Eastern, 4.30pm Pacific. Mystic, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me at Mystic Shroud on Twitter. And you can find me at, at Daz Hots on Twitter. And if you're looking for Liquid, at Liquid GG, that's L I Q I U D. He spells it wrong for whatever reason on Twitter. Uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you happen to find your podcasts online. I'm pretty sure we're there. You can also visit our website, trolls.gg, slash the Nexus Trolls, watch us and past shows, along with past video streams, which also can be found on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash trollsgg. For announcements about the show and general Heroes of the Storm news, you can follow us on Twitter at, at the Nexus Trolls, or you can follow our network at, at TrollsGG, one word. And if you want to hang out with the Trolls community in-game, you can slash join TrollsGG, again, one word in-game, or join our Discord channel. The information there for, to, to join that is at trolls.gg slash Discord. We're also going to be doing after show games tonight uh, because we reached that Patreon goal uh, a couple months ago. So if you'd like to join us in game to slash join the Trolls GG channel or talk kiss up in Discord, we're going to be playing shortly after the show is done. And finally, if you need to get in touch with us, the best way is by email at the Nexus Trolls at Trolls GG. So, Mystic, thanks again for hosting with me, bud. It's been a slice. Everybody, thanks for listening and have a great week. Cause I'm TNT I'm dying now